5 tips to create secure Docker containers for Java developers. But first, we need to talk about something. We need to talk about containers. Because what is a container actually? Well, if you look at a container as a real world thing, a physical thing, it is a receptacle for holding goods. Basically, it's something that holds an object or a liquid or whatever. It is a portable compartment in which fright is, is placed. Basically, that's how you describe a container. If you look at containers in real life, it can be anything like a soda can for holding your Sprite or your Coke. It can also be the airtight container that you use to put your leftover food in. However, it also, and that's what people think of containers, can be a shipping container. You can ship all sorts of goods in a shipping container and it's placed on a train or a boat ship, I might have to say, or for instance, a truck. All of these things are there for the same purpose, to hold the stuff that they contain, hold that in the exact same or as good as possible way as they were when they were put in. Think about it. Your soda can or your beer can is there to preserve the, the flavors and, and the, 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 the bubbles in it. Same holds for the airtight container to keep your food as, as good as possible over time. So you can store it, you can ship it. For the bigger container it's the same thing. It makes sure that if you, for instance, have your household in it because you're moving from one country to another, you will receive it in a unharmed way. So basically it keeps the containment safe. It's a layer of protection. And if you look at it from that way, it is some sort of boundary from the internals that you want to preserve towards the outward. So the influence from the outworld outward world cannot get into the content. For all three the same th things it holds the same. However, you need to you need to pick your container accordingly. For instance, putting your beer without a can into a shipping container doesn't make much sense. So, a container is there for a specific reason. If you see this picture and that is what a lot of people think, if you put a, if, if you think on, on, on it as a um, software concept, we can put software in a container. However, the difference is that although containers here are there for safety, a container, putting software in a container by default is not so much safe. It doesn't mean if you put your Java program in a Docker container, for instance, by default, it is not safe. However, you may think of that. And let me get to that because this is that container with my Java program in it. There is only a difference because this was the airtight container. And normally what we want with that airtight container, we want to make sure that the, the oxygen comes not, not comes in contact with the food that's in it. However, if we have a Java program in it, most of the time we need to interact with the outside world. We need to make sure that we can connect with a database, with a data source, with the user to get the user input. So there is two-way traffic from the content to and the outside world. So what I want to say is you need to pick your container in a good way. But also putting software in a container doesn't make it safe by default. My name is Brian. I'm a developer advocate and longtime Java engineer for currently working for Sneak. I'm living in the Netherlands and I'm doing a bunch of stuff for the community as well. I'm currently one of the leaders for the virtual jug and for the local Utrecht jug, which is one of the cities here in the Netherlands. And I'm also co-leading the DevSecCon community, which is a community that looks into application security, specifically um, to make applications more secure from a developer perspective. Last but not least, I am an Oracle Groundbreaker Ambassador for, uh, for a couple of years. But let's go into containers, and I specifically go into Docker containers. Because Docker st is still growing, and Docker grew tremendously, and over the years, Docker is the go-to source to containerize your application. It ha currently has about 1 billion weekly downloads of container images that you can use to build your own container on. 
although there are many other ways to build containers. I will keep it today to Docker, but many of these rules can also be, are also applicable to other ways of building a container. Again, I'm specifically looking at the combination for Docker containers and Java development. So this talk will give you five tips not to fill your security if you want to Dockerize your Java application. Let's go on with the first one. As you know, we built containers on top of other things, and we call that the base image. So we need to choose the right Docker base image for your Java application. And that sounds quite logical. However, well, let me just show you. In most cases, this is the first line in your Docker image or in your Docker file when you build a Docker image for your uh, application. It's from something. In this case, I say from Ubuntu. And that means I'm picking the Ubuntu, um, in this case, without any tag. So the latest Ubuntu image from Docker Hub, and I build my stuff on top of that. And just like with a house or a building, the foundation of that building is important. So is it with building your own Docker images. Last year, we did some research and we pulled the last, we pulled the latest or the latest version of the 10 most used images from Docker Hub. And we scanned them with the tooling from my company with Sneak to see if there are vulnerabilities in there. And as you can see, all of these 10 have vulnerabilities. And it goes from 31 from Ubuntu to 567 on the node um, image, node base image. It were the latest images. And that means there is no specific tag on it. What happens is, for instance, if we take the node image, the node image was not so much vulnerable itself, but it's also based on another base image. In that case, it was a Debian image, a somewhat older Debian image. And most of these vulnerability could be traced back to the operating system layer. So if we look at the operating system layer and we look at vulnerabilities in the in operating system images, this again is already a year old, but it just paints the picture for me. You can see the source in the, in the bottom, um, shifting Docker security left. But if we looked at the latest version of different um, um, different images from different operating systems, you see there is a bunch of different things in it. So, for instance, the Debian latest at that point had 55 uh, vulnerabilities. However, if I took the specific stretch slim image from Debian, it already decreased the amount of vulnerabilities. This means looking at your operating system layer is the foundation and is just as important as looking at your application vulnerabilities if you want to ship that container into production. If we mimic this to Java images and we look at the images from our friends from Adopt Open JDK, you see that if we look at the different flavors of that image, the amount of vulnerabilities that come with the operating system heavily differ. If I choose the latest version of Open, uh, Open JDK 11, which is based on Ubuntu, we, I only have 25. But if I specifically check the Debian one, I will have 75 vulnerabilities. And these are all from binaries that ship automatically with that operating system layer. The question you have to ask yourself is, what do I need? Do I actually need a full-blown operating system to build my application on? Probably not. So picking your the right foundation is essential for creating a good and secure Docker image for your Java application. But let's get into that deeper because use only what you need. If we look at a Docker file, for instance, and I do it the naive way and I will build it up to a better way, trust me. Typically, it looks something like this. I'm building a Docker image for my Spring Boot application. And the first line says I'm taking a random Maven 3 OpenJDK 11, which I found on Docker Hub. As you can see, I, um, I can create uh, or I, I create a uh, project directory. I, I copy all my sources to that. I'm setting it as the work directory. I'm calling Maven package to make sure there is a package. And I spin it up by doing a Maven Spring Boot run. 
Okay, fair enough. This works. This works perfectly fine. But if I look at the size of that image, that image is over 800 megabytes big. And of course, that Spring Boot application is already large. But I bring a ton of binaries in that I probably don't even need. Actually, I'm not sure what is actually in that OpenJDK 11 base image. And that makes you think. The build image doesn't need to be the same thing as the production image. I do not need Maven in my production image. Think about it. A few years ago, or maybe a decade ago, you would build the WAR or the AIR and you deploy only the AIR into your web server. Why are we building Docker images in a naive way? Hopefully you are, you already, you're not doing that. But you don't need Maven. You don't need the JDK. You just need a Ria Java runtime environment. So why not slim your production image down to what you actually need? Because Maven, J full JDK, and your source code are a liability if that is the stuff that is in production. If somebody gets in and can alter your source code and Maven is already available plus the complete JDK, we can, while that thing is running, we can rebuild the stuff probably or eventually and make it available to your customers. That's not what you want. What we do here is we create a multi-stage build. We use the Maven 3 OpenJDK 11 base image and what we did before as our building block, our, as our building image. We create the artifact that we want. And if you see on the second part, we take an OpenJDK 11 JRE, Java Runtime Environment image, based on Alpine, which is the smallest one. And what we do is we create a, a directory and we basically copy only the jar file that was in that first image to that second image, to my final image. From that point, I only need to set the work directory and go to a, and just call a Java minus jar argument on my executable jar. And this, this works perfectly. Now I know that I do not have Maven in it. I do not have the, 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 the JDK in it. I do not have my source file in it. And I have an Alpine image, which is a very slim Debian or a very slim Linux uh, based image with the JRE so that all the binaries that are there by default, for instance, from a Ubuntu or a Debian, Debian image are not there in my production image. The result is if I check this one on my computer and I see how large it is, at this point is just slightly less than 200 megabytes. And the last one was over 800 megabytes. That also means that fast, my, faster startup times and it is just it just does not contain stuff we don't need. Think about it. If you get a package from Amazon and your package is all filled up or the box is all filled up with bubble plastic and all that sort of stuff. It's a waste. But in this case, it's not bubble plastic. It are binaries that can be used. So having a have don't having a binary in it, having a binary removed that you're not using can also not harm you. If you think about it, that of everything that is in the top to, uh, top part in the um, uh, in the building image, will stay there. So, for instance, if you need to do a Maven build and you need to have um, you need to do do uh, a username and a password for a internal repository, you do not want to have that somewhere in a cache in your production image. This way you are sure things are things in your build image stay in your build image and you only copy the things you need into your production image, which is a very, very safe way to make a minimal based image. Talking, uh, th talking about minimal or least, let's go to the, the next one, which is the least privileged user or apply the least privileged principle in this. What does that mean? Well, again, go, we're, we're going back to, to that Docker image I, I showed you before. All right, all right. I already have the multi-stage build, and that is perfectly fine. However, in my production image, so let me just highlight my production part, so gray out the, the, the build part. 
I am not doing anything with users. By default, this means that my Docker image runs as the root user. And that is probably not what you want. Maybe there is a property file in it with, with your with the credentials towards your, your database because that application needs to make a connection. Or you do not want to have your user to have more privileges than needed because that can turn out quite weirdly. You can do that by just creating another user. And I do that over here. Okay, let me, let me highlight the lines that are important here. I get it. So the yellow lines are important here. Note that this is an Alpine image. So it, it, it might be a little different if you want to use an Ubuntu image, Ubuntu based image, because well, simply the commands are different. But what I do here, I add a group called Brian Vermeer and I add a system user. And that system user doesn't have a ter have terminal access and it's also called Brian Vermeer and connected to the group Brian Vermeer. All fine. I set the work directory, I copy the, the, copy the jar over and then I um, make sure that my newly created user is the one that owns that project file. So what does it mean that only my user can do something in that project file? You can do it differently if you want to have more or, or less access in that case. Then there's something important. The last yellow line, which has user Brian Vermeer, in this case, I make sure that I call that user first and that all the points after that are called by that user. I specifically select that user. If you're not doing that, you're still running as root. So make sure you select that user before you end or you run certain things that might not be, that, that must not be run by any other user. So create a new user with smaller privileges. Make sure that he, that user can access and actually uh, do something with your new program and make sure that you call that user. So the entry point in this case will be called by my newly created user that only has privileges on that project setting. Well, we're talking about containers and a lot about containers, but we also need to talk about our application. And we need to scan our both our Docker images and our Java application during development if there are any problems with it. And these problems can be okay now, but it can be wrong later. If a vulnerability, vulnerability will be found over time. If we look at, for instance, things like build packs, well, let's skip this one. Let's, well, as, as you can see that different build packs, which are also um, base images, they differ from how many vulnerabilities they have in the beginning, but I already showed you that. But we also asked in that open source security uh, report in, in 2019 and in 2020, we asked them, we asked people like, when do you scan your Docker images for, op uh, for, for operating system vulnerabilities? Unfortunately, 50% of our respondents say we do not. And that is, that is, that is an easy, that, that, that is, that is a thing that can be easily solved with, for instance, the tooling that SNCC provides, SNCC provides you. Of course, there are other tooling, but everything I will show you today is free of use. So you can try it today, tomorrow, or whatever you want. But I'm just getting into that. You should know what is in your image. So for instance, if I do, if I pull an image like, like the open, latest open JDK image, I can scan it like this. And let me just show it to, to, to you. I think that is even easier. I'm just scanning the op adopt OpenJDK, OpenJDK 11 latest image. And by doing this, I already pulled the image, so that's already on my local machine, but you don't even have to do that. As we can see, this base image that, that we're using has 27 find found issues, and we already see that there are high severity, medium severity, and even low severity if you go back, far, farther back to, uh, to the top. So by investigating on forehand, we can see that hmm, this might not be the one we want to use. If you are a Docker Pro user, you already get this info from Docker desk the desktop as Sneak provides that info to you. However, if we look at that, we can also check our own containers. So if, for instance, I created the container all already that I show you before with that multi-stage build, and I do a Sneak container test on example version two, 
I can also uh, make sure that the file is there. So my file, that's the Docker file that is that is connected to this container. So we can give you, if needed, give you remediation advice. And what we do over here is it will scan the um, Docker image to see if there are key binaries and um, base images that have problems and if it's possible to remediate them. As you can see, it tested my container and it didn't find any vulnerabilities because, well, it was based on the Alpine um, Alpine Jerry image. So what we can do as well is we instead of only instead of only um, testing our stuff, we can also monitor our examples or um, our, our images. By doing this, it, it will analyze the dependencies we have in our Docker container, and it will sh and, and it will share it with uh, it will connect it to your Sneak account, so you can see it over time. If there is a new vulnerability found, you will see it. In your console. And so what you see now is that we have your container now monitored and if there are new problems we can actively ping you. But that's not all because next to the docker container or the container whatever you use is your application. Your application is also an attack factor because if this is your application how much of that application is actually the code you wrote? It's probably somewhere like this. Right? This is the code you wrote um, you reviewed it, you had pair programming on it, whatever, you had a lot of eyes working on the code you actually created. But the rest of the code of the binary of that jar is probably heavily depending on frameworks like my Spring Boot framework brings in a lot of dependencies and I have no clue if these dependencies do have problems or not. On top of that, we have another circle that is your container, but we also talk, we already talked enough about that container because what we need to know is that new vulnerabilities are, are there and there are more each and each year, as you can see, and it's growing. And if we look more closely to that, you see that in the middle one is Maven Central, but you can also look at NPM because these are the two biggest ecosystems. Most of the time, the problem is not in the direct dependencies, but in the indirect dependencies, though your dependencies bringing in other dependencies, bringing in other dependencies, and deep down, there is an issue. And you might think, yeah, okay, but I am secure. What can possibly go wrong in my application? Let me show you that. So here I'm having a Spring Boot application. And that Spring Boot application is not very interesting. If you look at the Spring Boot application, what it does, it is a grocery list. A grocery list that has milk for 50 cents, or a bean for 50 cents, and milk for $1.09. Interesting, right? Not at all. Also, the item is not very interesting because the item just is a POJO with an ID, a name, a cost, and some getters and setters. However, if we look at the item repository, then it starts to get interesting because I am having, I'm using Spring Data and Spring Data REST. And with Spring, with Spring Data, I can use the, well, I can extend the CRUD repository which gives me a bunch of power so that I do not have to write all the CRUD logic myself simply by inserting a find by name like this in this interface it will help me with the parameter name so i can just give it a name and it will find my grocery by name that's cool but with this annotation and with spring data rest it will transform my crud repository into a rest repository and that is nifty because now I can use it to, well, as a prototype to go on. But as we know, prototypes will not always stay prototypes. And I will show you what, what can go wrong over here. I will get redirected to my Hell Browser, which just shows me what a certain endpoint can do. For instance, if I do the endpoint items slash one, and let me enlarge this a little so you can see it, you will see that it will bring back my first item in my grocery list. Same works with two. It will give me my second item. Also, I can do searching, like over here. I can search, use the find my name from my CRUD repository and give it a name, beer. By doing that, it will return me the result like beer for $5.99. Interesting. However, there is an issue with this specific version. If I'm showing you this curl request, I'm doing a curl patch with a content type, which is perfectly fine, it's JSON patch. And the buddy is this part. 
until where is the end of my uh, over here and as you can see this buddy is just based on JSON only within this JSON I am utilizing the spring expression language SPEL and with the spring expression language I am able to interfere with objects but I'm also able to create new objects like the runtime like the runtime get runtime and what I do I execute something so I execute the value etc slash patch wd basically what I do I do a cat on that etc patch wd and I redirect the input stream to an output stream so I can do that so I can show it to you but that curl request is fired up on this endpoint and this endpoint was the endpoint to show me the first item in my grocery list interesting right so if I copy paste this and I execute it you will see that this is the internals of my past WD file so even though you might think you're not vulnerable we now see that by using a certain library from a version that was vulnerable and already fixed like long long time ago don't get me wrong but because you're using it you didn't write it yourself you are vulnerable and the attack factor goes on and on because if I do this in my container and I do, did not have or I, I run it as root I will have the same result but if I have a more privileged user or a user with a smaller scope then this would not be possible this means that you do not want to only look into your application or only into your um, container you need to look at both because if a vulnerability exists or if a hack exists it's not just one thing that went wrong it's a domino way of things going wrong and people will find out over time that there is maybe a new exploit so you should patch in all sorts of levels scary isn't it by just having in the wrong version of that, that library you can you can get around that by doing a sneak test on your application as you can see there are an, a bunch of issues in this in this uh, application and some issues have direct uh, fixes and some don't next thing you need to build your application to be rebuilt so build to rebuild and what does that mean well say we have that you have we have your Java application in your um, docker container it's the yeah, tight container but still it's a docker container just for the sake of argument well say we do not have one we have three of these applications we have three pods or three instances running and that's all cool now we found for some reason we find out that the third instance there's somebody in it it's hacked or we see that things go wrong it's weird the first thing you want to do is to make sure that 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 single instance is demolished is gone because hey the immediate threat is gone so we just blow it up but we must be able to blow it up right and yet again automatically we want to spin maybe want to spin up a new version or create fix the stuff and deploy a newer version like this over here this means that individually your pods or your instances need to be developed in such a way that you can rebuild you can easily tear them down uh, instantly and you can rebuild them if you need it so at that point your the easy threat or the immediate threat is gone so if you have a Java application that contains data and stores in a database make sure that it, it's not part of your container also things like files or log files shouldn't be part of your container and again if you use caching it is cool caching but be sure be aware that the cache will be gone if you terminate that container so it should be all of these should be outside of your container or for instance if we talk about cache you sh it should be automatically inserted again for instance if you use a in-memory data grid like for instance hazel hazelcast i have i have no stock options for them with them but the point is make sure that your container is aut autonomous and it can work you can demolish it and you can spin it up every single time and it doesn't infect the data 
you need to serve your clients or you need to get from your clients. So make sure that you can rebuild this. 20% of the Docker image vulnerabilities can be fixed just by rebuilding them. And that is because we are using things like latest. If you look at this, we're using the latest. The latest now, the latest function now is not the latest tomorrow. So you can do th two things, or you can do a specific version. So you put the hash on uh, on the end that, that, that connects to a specific version. So every time you build it, you rebuild, you rebuild that image from scratch, uh, it will have the same base image, or you rebuild it over time. It same runs with if you're using app, app get or something like that. So if you're doing this, even if your application is not, it did, it did not change, you need to rebuild your container often. If you do it like this, you need to rebuild it because the latest version of Ubuntu or whatever version you're using, it has changed and probably has fixes in it. And if you use a static version, you need to update that version as well to see if there are newer versions on it. And well, with Sneak Monitor, you can get alerted for that, but that's another thing. If you rebuild your application, make sure you skip the cache. So Docker build dash dash no cache. Make sure that even if you have cache over there, you make sure that you, you, you skip that cache. So you always have the latest version from Docker up. All right, small recap. Five things that we discussed today was, first of all, we need to lay the foundation correctly. So choose the right base image, not blindly choose it, but do some investigations. And I showed you how you can do that with, um, with the sneak tooling to um, check out a, um, a, specific, uh, a specific base image if it contains vulnerabilities or not. Um, make sure you only pick from that base image or the built image what you want. Use these multi-stage builds and use the, JR, the, the, the Java runtime environment and not the complete JDK and Maven and your source file in your production image. That is not needed and is an attack factor. Of course, don't run your application as root, but make sure you have a privileged user that can only do the things you need to do or that user needs to do. I showed you how that you can scan your applications and on top of that, your images and make sure you scan and monitor them during development, but also when they are in production. So you get actively pinged if there is a new problem available or a new solution. And last but not least, if you design an application to be cloud native or for a Docker or for in a Docker uh, instance, make sure you can easily rebuild that application. So no storage of, of, of data in that uh, container because that will be lost if I terminate it. Make sure that's outside of the container. So build to rebuild and rebuild often. All right, this was my talk. Thank you. Everything I used in the tooling over here, I you can use it for free. Go to snickdo.io and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them or to ping me on Twitter. Thank you. See you later.